I guess we could uh, call, call to order and um, roll call. Okay. Chair Guy Mason. Present. Vice Chair Scott Gilbert. Present. Helene Federici has not signed on yet. Sarah Harkness. Here. Austin Stryker has not signed on yet. Andy Sakaris. Here. Amy Wilson. Here. Council Member Cuesta has not signed on yet. Um, excused, we have Marie Hoda. Okay, Helene has just signed on. And um, late um, Jen Hubbard, they have an Inglewood School Board meeting and she said she'll sign on as soon as they're done with that meeting. And staff, we have Director Underhill and Library right. and Cultural Arts Manager, Mark Mullis. All right. And Debbie, right, just so you know, you. I did get an email from Austin saying he wasn't gonna make it tonight, so. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, are there any uh, questions from the minutes? Screen share here. And you can all see that okay? Yes. Perfect. All right, and if I can make note, um, Council Member Quest is joining the meeting. Andy. Move to approve the minutes. I second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Minutes are approved. Um, any public I'm not seeing? No. Okay, so I guess we can move into the library statistical report. I believe you sent out a new one or something. Yeah, it looks like this is updated here in the board packet, um, but I know that uh, we're, we're waiting a lot of times on um, adult programming numbers as a one or two programs that are kind of run by external entities that are <laughs> not always super quick about getting us their numbers. Um, I'll explain when we get there. Uh, so November, um, the biggest change this month in terms of visitors, um, and in terms of um, circulation is gonna be that due to the uh, level red uh, restrictions, um, we decided to uh, suspend in-person computer services. Um, so we're still doing curbside, we're still doing all of our um, virtual stuff, we're still doing you know access to the collection, but it's kind of back where we were uh, early summer, um, late spring, early summer. Um, that we were getting about 20 to 30 people a day uh, coming in to use the computers. So it wouldn't be, and, and then this uh, went into place after Thanksgiving, so that's not gonna be hugely reflected in the numbers here, but just a heads up to all of you, that's, you know, uh, it's, it's a factor and it'll definitely be a factor when we look at the December numbers next month. Um, 1180 physical visitors, that counts curbside and, and um, in-person computer use. Uh, virtual visitors, I did, you know, interestingly, I broke down the numbers. Um, I think it was Helene had asked at the last meeting about breaking down those um, numbers from uh, 2019 to 2020. Uh, the, what's the split between PICA and the city's website? And are we seeing more or less traffic to the city page? Um, numbers were largely pretty consistent year to year, like the proportions of those numbers. Uh, we did see a little bit more um, activity last year uh, on the specifically on the how to get a library card page on the city's website. So people, fewer people looking for how to get a library card right now, although I can tell you I'm getting a few emails a week from people trying to figure out. Uh, actually, that's, that's, that's too many. I've, I got a couple emails in the last month from people basically who've gone to our website, gotten a temporary library card, um, and then they're trying to figure out how do I convert this into a full library card since there's you know not really easy to come into the library to do that. Um, and until we shut back down, we were letting people just come into the library to do that. That was one of the things we we'd, we'd allow uh, access for. Um, and now what we're doing, um, just so you all know, is um, if somebody has a temporary library card, we can see that when we um, put place their holds. 
And so we're just going ahead and when they come to pick up the holds, we just get them a full service library card and take it out to them. We ask for ID, hopefully they have it. If they don't, we're generally, we're in a trusting mode, let's say, um, because you know we wanna make sure we're you know, getting people the materials they need. Um, so you know you won't see too much of a change in the uh, patrons register collection size that's all pretty much the same uh the circulation pattern is really holding consistent from the last few months um which is that um if you look at total circulation it's running about 50 percent of what it would normally be doing and that's being you know, the ground there's being made up for the digital materials digital materials really if you category by category breakdown outpacing where we were at last year by quite a wide margin but what's once again it's that tumble books thing that we, because the schools aren't in session we're not getting nearly as much activity on tumble books as we normally do and so that makes the numbers look like they've slipped a little bit since last year but that's not the case when you exclude tumble books um, that would account for about uh, 1,000 additional circulations so um, questions answered. We're getting a little bit more precise in answering that question because we're, we're we're trying to be more specific about um, really using a like this, this old school clickers. To, every time we get a email or a phone reference question, um, we're making sure we're we're, we're tallying those numbers. Um, and then that computer usage two hundred eighty five. That was just how many visitors we had um, for the days that we were open. Uh, uh, let's see, programming numbers, a lot of that's going to be driven by take and makes. And then I can tell you that in the adult programming, that 134, that's a combination of NaNoWriMo take and make, or not, not take and makes, but like we did like a NaNoWriMo care package. Um, and then we also did, um, uh, there's a monthly meeting that the Masonic Philosophical Society does called Life, the Universe, and Everything. You'll see it advertised on the Facebook page. That gets really good numbers. It's gotten really good numbers ever since. I mean, we're talking in the like uh, upper uh, upper double digits, um, uh, and that's so that's actually a huge part of the adult programming numbers. Um, and that's that has increased quite a bit since it went virtual. Um, and it's definitely one of those things where we'll probably talk to them at some point when this is all over and say like, given where we're at, do you want to keep doing it virtually if that's where, you know, if that's where the audience is, but who knows? Um, any questions about any of that? Um, I just had one question about registering people for library cards. I'm wondering if the city um, registers their employees, like it could almost be seen as a benefit, like, hey, I get a library card and it's the library's right by my work. Yep. Yeah, actually, HR has, a, or when they onboard people, um, oh, the, good. The, the library card registration is kind of just a little add-on in the onboarding process. Good. Yeah. Um, kind of on the topic of those take and makes doing well for programming, uh, sorry, just to return to that for a moment, because that's been such a hit, you know, we've got the holidays coming up, Holiday Express, sadly, was canceled for City of England this year, also reflecting the, 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 the current status of public health orders. Um, so we're really push, going to be pushing take and makes over the next few weeks here. So keep an eye out for that. Um, I know the goal is to try to get it so that we're doing one a week, um, but they take a lot of, a lot of, a lot of prep. So um, I know we got a lot of staff working on that. I have a, I have a question. You, you, you just brought up something and I, I don't know if this is out of place in the meeting, but you mentioned having a lot of staff to work on things. Um, how are you keeping uh, the new hires busy since the, the plans to reopen got delayed? That's a great question. That's actually been something that's occupied a ton of my time the last couple of weeks. Let me see if I can pull up a list. I'm just kind of run through it real quick. So um, what we're doing right now um, with curbside is we, you know, the city, citywide, we wanted to try to reduce in-person staffing and, and anybody sure. can be working from home, we're asking to work from home. Um, now, obviously for our library staff, um, they, there are things that they can do productively um, offsite, um, but then if we're, we really think operating continuing to operate library material circulation via curbside pickup is is a core service and that's something that we're not planning to at any point here um, end. 
um, unless things truly got dire and we were back in full lockdown mode, like a level purple, I guess. Um, so um, what we're doing is we, we, we looked in to determine how many people do we need to be able to do curbside on any given day. We're having that many people come in and then we're sending everybody else home. So there's one supervisor or manager on site and then a handful of staff members and then that's it for the day. So we're doing, we're having things like, I'm just gonna run through uh, the staff list here. So for example, um, one of our associates is working on putting together uh, local resources for um, people experiencing homelessness, for people needing financial assistance, that sort of thing. Um, they're putting, they're, they're, they're reaching out to some of the local um, the, like, like shelters and, and, and sites where people can receive assistance and kind of you know, asking them what, how, if there's anything we can do to coordinate. Um, and they're making check-in calls to some of our senior patrons that we've had uh, that are in our, um, that were previously uh, our homebound delivery patrons. We're, we're just reaching out to them individually and just kind of checking in. Do, are they aware that they can get materials through us still? Like, what can we do for them? That, that sort of thing. Um, we've got another staff member who is um, putting, who's work, who's kind of taking over one of the book clubs. And so they're doing prep work for that. Um, they're putting together social media posts. Um, they're working on um, kind of um, helping to maintain the writers group that we do. Uh, we have another one who's doing, um, let's see, uh, somebody who's starting to, to go through the historic archive that we have. Um, and since they're not working in close proximity to the other staff, we consider that to be a safe thing that they can do. Um, so they're inventorying that collection. They're, they're, they're strategizing around what can we do in terms of building displays, which of these materials can circulate, that sort of thing. Fortunately, we have a couple of our new hires, the, specifically the kind of people you asked about, Scott, who have archival experience. And that was one of the things that we were looking for in the hiring process was people who could help yeah. you know, actually do something with that collection of materials. Um, people putting together take and makes. Um, we have people who are doing our, all, all of our social media posts, our email newsletter, trying to write book reviews for our Goodreads account. You know, it's it, like basically we we went through every single staff member and we kind of checked in. You know, I had the, the supervisors checked in with them like, what are you interested in? Like, what have you been doing for us? That's the kind of work that could translate to work from home. And what are you interested in doing that we've never done before? Um, and so that's where stuff like the historic archive came up. That's where stuff like um, some new programs that are being developed have, have, have come up. Um, so, you know, we're really trying to make sure that if we're sending people home right now, that they're using that time meaningfully. Yeah. Um, that's good. That's a work in progress. This is a totally new process for sure. us. <laughs> we're, doing our, we're doing our best with it. Uh, and I'll know more, you know, I had my I had my meeting last week with the supervisor team and, and basically it was, okay, go forth and meet with your staff and then tomorrow we'll meet again and kind of figure out where we're at. But, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna take a lot of developing uh, systems for accountability that are um, giving people space so that we're not micromanaging their, their work, but also that we're making sure that that time is being used well. And now I'm, I'm done rambling about that answer. That oh, no, answers I'm, your question. No, I'm, I'm, I'm too thoroughly. No, I, I, I'm glad to hear it. And I'm really glad to hear about the uh, historic and archiving um, activities that I think were a real core function for Englewood. And um, yeah. also, the um, I'm heartened uh, to hear about um, looking for homeless resources and the, um, the seniors, because uh, people, uh, you know, this, this shutdown, as rough as it's been on me and I worked from home almost all the time anyway. There's a lot of people where their world's just upside down and I'm really glad to hear the library yeah. is doing that. And it's on our hearts because, you know, those are the people who are, you know, largely the ones who are coming in to use our computers for the last couple of months. Yeah. Um, so we're trying to figure out ways that we could still provide some service to them, um, do so safely. Um, the historic archive, one, one, one of the little, little, just piggyback on that a little bit though, um, because this came up at the last board meeting, we were asking with the microfilm machine and the availability of some of those newspapers digitized. We do have a, um, we're working with Marmot to get, um, there's like a Colorado historic newspaper archive that we'll be, we're hoping to integrate into PICA. Um, oh, nice. So it won't just be, they, they have a lot of issues that Herald scanned, but then they also have historic newspapers from around Colorado. So we're, 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 we're excited about that. that. That'll be something that's, you know, totally free to us. Um, but that'll be accessible through the catalog. So, I have a question, a follow up question about this um, increased social media efforts. Yeah. So, um, since you have uh, staff members engaging more on social media, are you seeing a return on that? Like, are you seeing increased engagement overall? 
you know, only the, the funny thing is I'm not seeing nearly as much as I want to be seeing. I'm not from, not in return, but in terms of what we're posting. Um, so, uh, like, I think right now, if you look at our Facebook page, it's very children's focused. I mean, it's, it's almost all the children's programs and story times, and those are doing well. Um, but those are not, that's not the only audience that we have, and it's not the only thing that I want to see there. Um, so, um, this is something that I'm going to be kind of following up on and trying to figure out. I, I, I want to be seeing regular um, activity uh, that's trying to appeal to a diverse range of audiences um, and not just the, 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 the children's stuff. Um, and I also think we, we know we might be looking into, um, uh, we, I, I would like us to explore what are some other platforms that might have uh, some value. You know, I think we have all of our eggs in the Facebook basket right now, and I'm not sure that's the right way for us to go. I think it works for delivering um, the live stream story times and programs. Like I said, those those do well, um, uh, but that's kind of all I'm seeing right now. So Are I think there's work to be done. Right now on Facebook. What's that? Are your book clubs on the Facebook? The book clubs are not on Facebook. I mean, well, we're yeah, we'll we'll post the events as an upcoming thing, but the book clubs are being done via Zoom. And. Um, you know, the good read reviews are really interesting. I wonder if you're cross promoting those onto Facebook, like posting those reviews on there and maybe even uh, putting a feed on the website with the book reviews. Uh, the feed is an, the feed's a really interesting idea. When we roll out the new website, um, 2021, um, I definitely would be curious if that's a function that we could have. Um, the uh, cross promoting them on Facebook also a, a, a possibility, although then I mean there's a, a recursive aspect to that of like are you you know are you, what, what are you are we successfully converting people from who uh, a range of followers on Facebook over to another service that's something like Goodreads and is that providing meaningful engagement you know I, I, with Goodreads that's one that I'm I'm somewhat skeptical of because I'm trying to figure out what's the end value to our users, you know, trying to make sure that we're somehow connecting it back to providing value to the community of people who use Englewood Library. Um, I think the book review itself is a value. And so my reason, um, you know, because if I'm if I'm browsing the website or exploring and I come across a review or I'm interested in a book and I can see a review on it, I think it adds value, especially yeah. because it's coming from someone local who's at my library. Like there's like a nice um, connection to that. And so my reason for talking about cross promoting it on Facebook isn't so much to drive traffic to Goodreads, but to leverage that content. Yeah, and yeah. you know, maximize it because I don't think a lot of people go to Goodreads, and it could help just just adding more content, and then also the archives. Like, is everything as it gets archived? Is that are those interesting pictures and all of that being posted on all the sites too? Yeah, yeah. The archive to me is one that could be uh, the great, uh, like, just a great stream of content for Facebook and Instagram. It, it, you know, Instagram in particular jumps out at me. Um, the Goodreads one, you know, I think we, we're kind of what you're describing is something that I've always felt is really important. And it's, it's, you know, library staff, we tend to be somewhat shy people, but I think there is real value, you know, like when you have regular library users, they get to know your staff and they get to know who has interests that align with theirs. Um, and, and, and you also have, you know, all, all of our staff are active readers and they have specific interesting, you know, specific interests that are kind of niche and kind of interesting in and of themselves. And I think there's a chance to kind of, you know, it's a cultivate a small audience at least to say like, oh, I know this person's reviews are, you know, they, like they like mysteries. So I'm going to be interested whenever they have something to say. And, and that's, I think, the idea there. Um, I, I think it's, you know, it's going to take some consistency and some follow through to, to really make it a success. And I think I'd like to see, you know, post pandemic that we tie content that we're putting onto Goodreads and kind of building up sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of range of reviews that we've done, connecting that to staff picks that are physically inside the library. You know, and it might be that we print out a review and, you know, you have it, uh, you know, along with copies of the book and it might be that you have your staff picks area and you say like, hey, and if you're interested in more stuff like this, follow us on Goodreads, you know, that there's kind of some sort of uh, synergy between those two things. Mm -hmm. um, but kind of, you know, a, a really aligning like 
we're trying to like almost build like little followings for your different staff. Like that's that's something that I think there's potential for there. I really like that idea and I, I feel it because yeah, you're right. Like when you get to know your local um, like mystery books or biographies, like if you have a favorite, it means something coming, I think from your local librarian. So I'd like yeah. to see those reviews propagated yeah. all over. <laughs> sure, okay, cool. Thank yeah, you. well, yeah, thank you for that. Anything else on the numbers? I'm sorry, I don't, I don't, didn't tell me when to move the, I've never had to talk about things and also control the, the, the screen before, so. Are there any other questions on the statistical report? I do move on to the, uh, the action plan. Right. Um, I actually wanted to ask everyone about the action plan. This is all new to me. When do we make the 2021 action plan? And how does that, how does that come together? I know that that's presented to you all. Is that something that you just get to see for the first time in January? I think January. Um, yeah. All right, Scott, anybody? That's what I recall, yeah. Yeah, I'm Mark. It's weird um, that we don't really write the action plan. It's just kind of you do. <laughs> Mark, Happy to do um, it. Just, John, <laughs> go ahead. John met with um, Kimberly, Megan, um, you know, the other supervisors and came up with kind of a draft action plan. And then in January, February, um, John presented it to the board. Excellent. The board gave it. Happy to do that. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about what our 2021 goals are. So, and as I've been putting this together, I'm like, oh, the action plan is going to be easy. <laughs> you know, it's kind of one of those things where it's like, I didn't know the process. We'll figure it out. So, um, the rest of COVID. That's yeah, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, so starting off with the, you know, uh, marketing and outreach efforts, including social media and website marketing, you know, we're, we're talking about our social media. I, we're seeing good communications on Facebook, especially the children's stuff. But, it, but I did, like I said, I want to see more targeting adults. I want to see more targeting um, just a diverse audience. Um, the email newsletter has been going great. Matt, uh, Matt brought us is one of our staff members. He's completely taken that over. He's also the one who's kind of running Goodreads for us and he's doing a, just a phenomenal job. So I'm super happy with him or super happy with that uh, and him. He's a great guy. Um, and then staff making the direct outreach calls to the seniors. I think that's a really important thing. Um, teen population, we, we've talked about what we're doing from, you know, teen space. Um, one thing that I thought was really cool is we, we, I guess annually we do a teen holiday party that's not happening this year uh, for obvious reasons, but the, um, the staff who work closely with that group are putting together these personalized care packages um, because they've gotten to know all these kids really well. Um, and they're, um, you know, they're not spending a ton of money on it, but they're just kind of putting together like a nice thing with a couple of small gifts that are just kind of reflective of the personalities of, the, of, the, of our, you know, active teen and tween users. Um, so I'm, I'm really, I think that's a really cool way to connect to sort of our core, like anytime you're doing teen services, it's all about building a connection to that core group. And then they kind of help to build out your, you know, your, as they can sometimes pull their social circle in, that's, that's where you really, you need to start is by maintain building and maintaining a connection with the core group of teen users. And the fact that our staff have been able to maintain that through present circumstances is to me just really worth celebrating. Um, and then uh, we did, uh, I'll kind of mention it later on too, and we kind of give you the projects update, but we, yeah, we did buy, make a bunch of purchases for the teen space as we're putting that together. Um, this is on trying to increase our circulation. Uh, we're, <laughs> we're, at, we're back in curbside mode, as I mentioned before. And then we're increasing awareness of the history. We've got the two new staff members who've been signed inventory and uh, plan for libraries archive of, of historic materials. Um, I mentioned the newspapers. I mentioned the, uh, regarding the microfilm. I think I mentioned last time that we're going to be labeling and recoding the, the local history collection that we have, since that tends to get reintegrated back into nonfiction the way things are right now. So we're working on that. That's one of our sort of work from home duties that we're doing, um, although that has to be done in person. Um, and then 
this uh, online photo collection, um, that one's going to have to, that, that's going to have to continue in 2021. Poor Celine's just absolutely overwhelmed with how much she's got going on. She's got a lot of things that she juggles. Uh, we're going to bring in some staff in to try to help her out with that, um, but they need to get trained. It's, it's pretty precise. Uh, the, the one thing that probably should be included here, but is not, is the um, digitization effort for the um, oral histories. Um, and so those, but we, we checked in with the vendor that we're working with to do that. And those are four weeks out, apparently. That, that's their estimate. So we should, hopefully by the next time we, we meet, we'll at least receive those. Um, okay, that is it for action plan. Great. Um, we get to move on to new business now. <laughs> All right. So, it's like reopening update. Um, well, I think I think you all know the status right now. We're hoping to just see the numbers decline. Um, the COVID numbers, of course. Um, I was personally pleased to see, you know, these the last couple of days, the, 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 the things have kind of, the, the, they seem to be trending in the right direction um, after a rather scary month. Um, we'll see if that maintains. We don't, you know, I haven't talked to Christina about specific, like when we might, you know, reopen, but I do know that when we do, we're not, we're going to want to jump right into in-person circulation and browsing of the collection. We're not going to want, and, and, and with limited numbers, of course, um, but we don't want to be back in this situation of offering only access to the computers. I think we're, we'll be ready when numbers stabilize to, to take that next step. So I think this is the November agenda. Actually, the, the um, I December agenda. One. Is that the what's going on? Well, this that says December. The one I'm looking at, it says uh, new business is the library projects update for the team. Maybe looking at minutes or something? Yeah. I look at the wrong one. Well, I'm... I was wondering why. Yeah, that, that's yeah, kind of what I was expecting to be talking about. So I'm really just improvising here. Oh, that's for <laughs> <I'm> it. <laughs> Sorry, Here's, Mark. What, here's what I'm looking for. <laughs> Debbie, I'm so used to you running the show. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to sign it back over to me? You got um, it? No, I think I'm okay now. That's it. I think, That's I think I'm good That's now. It. I'm okay. sorry, everyone. <laughs> so, good catch, guy. <laughs> did I mention that I'm also uh, running remote learning for a first grader this week? So. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> well, I'll fried. All right. Um, yeah, projects update. So we, we ordered... Uh, furniture for the teen space. Uh, we ordered um, desks, uh, bean bags, um, whiteboard paint for the wall to do a whiteboard wall. Um, so we're gonna build like, they're building like a honeycomb for uh, like a corkboard honeycomb where students will be able to display their art or where kids will be able to display their art. Um, we've got a new projector, like a, a nice new projector for the movie nights that they do. Um, they, they, were, they got a Nintendo Switch, so we'll have gaming, you know, gaming programs, stuff like that. So they're going all out. Um, I'm really excited. I think it's going to be a pretty cool spot. Um, obviously, we'll have some, some work to do putting it all together, trying to make sure it, it, it looks nice. Um, uh, but I think that's going to be a really wonderful thing. And then um, tied to that, we are working with the communications department to uh, try to get some vinyl wall signs. So we're throwing around some, just, just things to, just sort of directional signage in the library. One of them will be for the young adult area in the teen space um, that just kind of add a, little, add a little punch of fun, you know, the, the, to the blank beige walls. Um, recording studio, I also met with our communications department to talk about because they had been coming in um, and using the uh, Anderson room to, to they basically have a big uh, green screen that they set up in there, uh, you know, green screen curtain, um, and then some lighting equipment that they have. Um, but they've been using us for the last, you know, a couple months now. Um, and it occurred to me that they were talking about like, oh, well, you know, once this is all over, it's going to be a bummer. We're going to have to find a new place to record. And I thought of something like, or do you? So we're, you know, we're going to, um, current plan is to, uh, Take one of the walls in Anderson and and turn it into just paint it green so that it can function as a green screen. Um, and then and then uh, we're we're investing in some lighting equipment that will just live in the closet there, 
um, so that we'll have an area in the library that people can do video recordings pretty easily. Um, that we'll have all the equipment right there. Um, we look, we're looking at the cameras um, so that we can even offer that. Um, and then in terms of the audio recording that like, like Helene brought up last time, um, met with our, or talked to, you know, met with, it sounds more formal, but I did talk to our IT department about it and, and confirmed that they have uh, a, a, a couple of computer, or at least you know a couple of computers that are beefy enough that they'll be able to run what we need. I don't think the 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 hardware requirements are gonna be super high, but they're kind of they're, <laughs> anytime that they get to talk about you know putting together something fun like this, they they, they kind of lit up. Um, so we'll have the uh, support we need from that end. It sounds like, um, and then we we're looking at the different study rooms that we have available. Uh, we're talking about possibly converting a study room. Um, challenge there is that they all have big glass windows so soundproofing is going to be really tough um and the visibility is very high which is not necessarily a problem but there i'm worried that those will be tricky um but they could also it could also be kind of cool if you can see in and see you know kind of have this sort of like oh what's going on over there what's you know a bunch of cool tech you know people are doing something fun looking one concern we have about using a study room is the um uh fact that a lot of times when under normal circumstances all four are in use um so if we convert one of the study rooms into, into a recording space then we're going to be encountering more frequent times when all of our study rooms are, are are in use and there's none available um that's not a deal breaker but it's just something to consider the other possibility would be to kind of re lay out our tech lab uh, the tech lab right now is just rows of computers, um, but we could probably rearrange it in there pretty easily to set up, like basically do a big corner desk or something and set up um, sort of a master workstation and then a, a couple of a table where, you know, you could gather a couple of people around to do like a podcast recording. The nice thing about the tech lab is you get a little bit more um, uh, noise separation from the rest of the library. Um, I think the acoustics will be a little harder to manage given that it's a larger room. Um, we'd also be able to, uh, if we can get the computer tables uh, to be something where they can be moved, um, we'd be able to open up the space. Um, and then you might be able to even get, you know, if you wanted to do a couple of musicians or something in our outside of our normal operating hours, you might be able to get them in a space like that. So. It, just a couple of thoughts that we, you know, as we were trying to explore this a little bit further, I wanted to bring it back around to you all and just kind of get your thoughts. The, the, those, those are some of the parameters we're operating in within. Do you have any feedback based on any of that? I like the idea of the tech room, um, partially just because that's a, I know that's a room that teens hang out in and mm -hmm. the type of teens who hang out in that room are gonna be interested in that kind of technology too. So just, I think if that could work, then it would be a great, great fit. Okay. I agree with that. Hey, what's what's up with the old, um, back when I first got on the board in like 2016, we met in a boardroom that was uh, like over by the self checkout thing and stuff. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, that's a, it's a staff workroom right now. Okay. Um, yeah, we have, and it, it used to be that we had all of our staff, our main staff workroom was in the back over by um, where the computers are. Uh, uh, and that, that half that room now is, that room is now shared with the Englewood Historic Preservation Society. And so that we kind of needed to, this, I'm, I'm fuzzy on when this all happened because I wasn't around for this for this particular bit of decision-making, but that was, yeah, at some point that became a staff workroom. With the tech room, um, is there, are you gonna run into a problem where there's people doing like a webcast and other people in the room with them, not part of it working yeah, on their I, I, I you know, usually with the tech lab, uh, we, we, we used to just kind of leave it open at all times, but it is something where we could reserve it. We could keep it, you know what I mean? Like you can make it so that you'd be able to, if you were going to use it for its recording studio function, that you'd be able to re reserve it for a block of time. We would reserve that put people out who are, would otherwise have access to, to computers. So, um, 
probably so the way we usually do the tech lab um let's see there are times when we just leave it it's just open and people can just go in there and use them as like extra sort of almost like overflow computers but then we also would have um blocked off periods of time where it was like uh you'd have computer classes in there etc um okay. and so probably we just flip we just invert that and it would basically be by default it's a reserved space you don't you know we 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 don't just have open access to it and then at certain peak times we might provide open access to it you just block off to say for these two hours it's you know open access tech lab and often what we do there would be um uh, what we've done traditionally is supplement that with volunteers who are available who can help out with just like you know, somebody's applying for a job they're not very tech literate they need somebody to sit down with them and, and work through the job application um and so basically you know i think what, what we would lose there would be day to day um somebody just walks in and they could just use the tech lab because by default you have to you'd have to reserve the space does that make that sense that seems like a little bit of a loss though it does seem like is it is it when the library is in full functioning mm -hmm. and you can walk in to the tech lab is it usually occupied um not it's been i'm sorry my my information my answer to that question is a little out of date because i <laughs> last last time i was working in the library and it was fully functioning was 2018 but um uh the my recollection is that usually you'd only have uh if anybody was in there it's like one or two people and they would kind of choose that space just because they liked to have a little bit more um, uh, isolation from others that they just would want to be kind of away from the crowd. Mm -hmm. uh, and so one option to serve that sort of need would be, um, you know, we, we, we have um, Chromebooks. Oh, gosh, I'm sorry, this is going, really going down a rabbit hole. Um, but we have Chromebooks that we'd always intended to be able to lend out to patrons and we're never able to do so because we didn't have a way to manage them. Um, they weren't able to be on the PC reservation system that we use. Um, but that in 2021, the PC reservation system will be able to, and it will be able to work with Chromebooks. And so we're thinking about activating that. And then we'd be able to basically say to somebody who just wants to be go, go into an isolated space, we've got, a, we've got a laptop for you. You can take this, you can go into a study room. And then you don't have to take up the big old the the, the tech lab. So, but maybe that's just Robin. And are the back in two thousand eighteen, um, were the study labs? You said that they were off. They were at times all occupied, mm -hmm. but was that a lot? A lot of the time, most of the time, were they all occupied or just peak hours? I, I would have to go back and look at the numbers on that. I really don't. I don't know. And this is just you know my. This is comes from when. After our last board meeting, I was talking this through with a bunch of our library staff, and that was the only that was the clearest objection I heard about using one of the study rooms for this purpose, other than soundproofing and the sort of limited space. Um, and so, I, just I don't know how much if, of that was a perceived problem versus how much of that's you know something really worth considering. Go ahead. I wonder if putting like strain on the tech lab is a bigger deterrent to using it because it seems like if people book by the way i've mentioned that this is happening to some other groups that i'm part of in mm -hmm. the city and like everybody's response is very excited about it cool. yeah. and i'm sort of getting a sense for what kind of crazy wacky stuff our community could produce and like could really in a way bring us together in a different way like i'm sort of seeing like it being maybe something that is popular so nice. assuming yeah, if, it, if it is popular that could really uh disenfranchise people who come to the library to use the tech lab for things like resumes and job hurt, uh, searches and really important technical access that they get from the tech room um i just wonder if having both activities in there would leave people would leave not enough for both that's my only concern and um uh, the other thing is more fortune telling which i know you can't do but i wonder if when things get more open in the next year or so are we going to see the study room still full are they full all the time like is there going to be like a um peak demand like there was previously and obviously none of us know that but i wonder how when we return back to quote normal what that even looks like is does it look like 2018 probably not so i think it's hard to like 
make those judgments, but I would hate to see people who are there for job searches, not mm -hmm. able to do and school projects and all the things that the tech labs used for. I'd hate to see that access um, hampered at all. Yeah, so. makes, makes perfect sense. Yeah, my, my, my preference, honestly, um, has been to, to convert one of the study rooms rather than to try to integrate this into the tech lab. Uh, I think there's strong arguments in either direction, but I, I, I think that, um, you know, what you're describing about the level of interest, I think that that's encouraging, but I think one of the biggest challenges of this is to basically make it obvious that it's a resource. I think the tech room or the study, the study rooms that we have would be, would, it, would it significantly increase the obviousness of it and, and would kind of make it so that, you know, if you walk through that space, you can't help but see that it's there and that there's a space devoted to that, which I think would help to encourage usage. Um, but anyway, yeah, I, I appreciate all that. That sounds one, good. I like that. Thank you. One thing I would ask the library to potentially consider is temporary soundproofing, because if this doesn't take off, why right. would we invest the money in doing this? Yeah. Um, you know, not to counter the point, but like I, I've talked to folks that are and they're like, well, it's I can set up my own podcast for about $50, $100 at home. So why would I go to a library space if I'm going to like do it? I've been on a lot of podcasts, half of them have done in Starbucks. Um, so, you know, I think I would, I would hate for us to convert a room and spend a lot of money soundproofing it when there are portable screens and portable microphone screens and portable isolation booths that we could potentially look into, um, as well as if we're going to convert it, you know, converting a space, let's also think of, are there... 3D printers, are there, you know, are there a maker, do we need a maker space? Like things like that, that I think a lot of their, other libraries are doing that I think cohabitate in that space. But I would hate for us to invest a significant amount of money soundproofing a room um, to find out that it's being used once. It may be used a lot in the beginning, but it, you know, I, I it, but I think what's the longevity of it? So I would just ask the, the library staff to consider that based on the patrons that we have. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, it's, it's being as somebody, I mean, I used to, you know, run a podcast from my basement, you know, like it was one of this uh, and, and tiny little space and not, not at all appropriately soundproofed and it was, and it worked out fine. Um, the, it, so I, <laughs> yeah, I think we've all been there. Um, the uh, soundproofing aspect, I, I think you're absolutely right. Like you can spend so much money soundproofing a space and really what you need there is if you're if you're having musicians in the space that you need soundproofing yeah. if you're not trying to record music you have a much lower degree you know unless you're really dealing with noise problems you know coming from outside into the space um yeah, you know, if you're just podcasting out of a study room nobody's going to hear you so that 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 part I'm, not, I'm a lot less worried about um you know i think when we say converting a space it's really just about setting up you know a desk setting up a permanent workstation and having a way to uh, house the equipment because you know we don't want the equipment put in there in such a way that it could, that's going to it's likely to just to walk out of the library, uh, you know we'll need a locking cabinet like that sort of thing. So it's that that's more what we mean in terms of space conversion right now, along with some you know basic temporary you like to describe soundproofing, and then some uh, physical branding I think as well. And I guess just one thing I wanted to add um, off of what Andy said with longev longevity. When I look at that computer tech lab, I wonder about that too and how you are talking about using Chromebooks instead. I feel like desktops are not really as, they take up a lot of space and maybe the future would be having laptops that you can move around and have a lot more flexibility so that you do have that extra space. And I have always loved the idea of maker spaces, but maybe that's for future date to talk about. Want to good follow through on our current projects before <laughs> before biting off too much more. But I, yeah, having yeah, I, I, I like the idea of the maker spaces a lot. It's something that I've, you know I, I think I've mentioned before. That I had the privilege of doing previously, and um, it's something that. Finding, if we can find the way, right, right way to align that with our community, I think that'd be a wonderful opportunity in the future. But you know, right now I wanna make sure we do our current projects right. Good, we move on. Um, are there any other new business or topics you want to discuss? 
or old business we forgot about the budgets our budgets all taken care of scott that's what i was going to ask him because oh. i don't remember last month i don't remember a lot of things um but uh, did, did did we get the discretionary budget spent down um we uh, so if i recall correctly it was 900 for uh buying equipment for recording studio and 900 for uh, spending on staff holiday okay. yeah celebration and and um yeah so we talked to the supervisors about a staff gift um and uh, we, we i guess we looked into gift cards and we looked into how all that would work and um it, it sounds like <laughs> christina can you confirm it sounds like the gift cards are pretty much it's just pretty pretty much a no-go based on city rules yeah, so um, we did consult with our finance department and ultimately we were told everything is taxable if it's gift card or cash. So Mark went back to the drawing board with the supervisors and Mark can share what they're going to do. I think the staff will appreciate it and they'll feel appreciated. Um, so go ahead and let them know what the gifts are yeah. this year. Yeah, so the, 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 um, we're doing um, like the, the, there was this, uh, we're buying a hoodie for everybody, like a small gift, like a gift. Uh, it's like a hoodie that says Carpe Librum. Um, and uh, then we're also doing uh, three days worth of uh, breakfast and, 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 and dessert, like festive desserts, um, the 21st, the 22nd, and then 23rd. Cool. Um, and we'll be emphasizing throughout that this is all, um, help, you know, the, the funding was helped by the library board. So that, that was the supervisor's recommendation. And I think they have a good read on the pulse of the staff. I think people are gonna really appreciate that. So. That sounds nice. good. I like that idea. Yeah. Cool. Good. I'm glad you're all <laughs> happy with that because I was like, I oh, hope the library board's on board because <laughs> I think this is what everyone likes. So, yeah. The yeah. staff. All right. Very good. Uh, is there any other, other staff's choice? I have an old business question just about oh, the business. website. I know the last that I remember us checking in about it, you were going to a city meeting um, <coughs> about the website. And I'm just wondering what happened from that. And like, oh, yep. The city is doing a what like the the whole city of Englewood website's getting rebuilt. Um, the we're, they're working with a third party uh, web developer who's then that that's supposed to roll out early twenty early twenty one, um, and the library will be updated as well as part of that, um, and then we're we've requested that so as this whole this, this is a weird project where it started out with the city looking at wanting to start to put together some microsites. Um, basically, certain city departments, it made sense for them to kind of have uh, a more custom build or more custom design to their to their site. Um, and then as that project <clears throat> moved along, it, be it became clear that like actually the whole city website needed a redesign. And so then that became the focus. So that's what's going to roll out in 2021. And then we'll go back to developing microsites. So. When the new city website rolls out, we're gonna the library page will be updated along with everything else because it'll be a new uh, it'll be a new CMS. Um, but then after that, we're in the queue to be one of the departments that gets a microsite. Um, so that'll be a little bit more customized than just the generic templating that comes from the that we'll, that we'll inherit from the new CMS. And that will be the the library site. That microsite will actually just be the library site. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's great. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when is that kind of scheduled? Right, I don't have the exact time frame. It's it's not my not, not my project. Um, but it's my understanding. It should be um, the the city's website should come out sometime in the first quarter, twenty twenty one, and then the microsites will start rolling out. I think second quarter, twenty one. Okay. Thank you for those updates. I'm really looking forward to seeing how all that. Yeah. Unrolls. Me too. <laughs> um, yeah, what, I, what I've seen from the design of the UC website looks really good, though. So I'm, I think it'll, yeah, that, uh, that I'm confident about. You know, I hope the uh, the new city website will have more precise searching. The The website the city has now is like the, the worst combination of intuitive searching and a wastebasket approach. It just, it drives me nuts. Interesting, yeah. yeah. There's, um, there's definitely some new search tools. There's actually like, it, it's a weird thing where there's like, like two different ways you, you can search it, but it, it ends up working. Um, so I, I haven't actually, you know, we've, we've just seen the design of it. Um, and so I haven't actually gotten to play around with it to see if it, <laughs> it's the results that you're describing, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful, um, okay. yeah. So Mark, are you going to be part of designing that microsite? I mean, when it comes time for that, are they going to be turning to you for the, for, 
the functionality and the layout of that microsite? I sure hope so. Yeah, yeah that, that's okay, that's fair. Yeah, yeah. I, I yeah I've been, sure I, I, I was I was I was I'm lucky enough to be on the committee for the city's website team. So you know, not that I've been like you know, been, I'm just on 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 the committee. Um, you know, I'm not not going to take credit for the design or anything, but um, yeah, we've we've been communicating with the communications department about that, and and I think we'll we'll definitely be you know in, involved. Um, I think they wouldn't be taking action if it weren't for us telling them what, what we want, so. Okay, good. I have one thing. Um, this is something we talked about. It's been a while, um, but we talked about the library was thinking about getting culture passes, like passes to museums and things like that. And then COVID hit and I don't think we talked about it again, um, but I'm just wondering, maybe that's something for staff who are, if it hasn't, happened, maybe something for staff to do who are working from home to get that together so that when things do open, the library can offer those passes. Yeah, yeah, I remember us talking about that. I guess, I guess in my head, I kind of put that on the back burner as a post COVID thing, but it maybe it does make sense to start thinking about it now. Yeah, Let me see if I can, we, yeah. Well, I'll bring, I'll bring that up with the supervisors and see if anybody wants to take that out of their wing. It's an interesting thought, thank you. Are there still the state park passes and um yeah yeah um, the state park the backpacks um those those are pop those were popular over the summer i don't know what, how they're doing right now um we ended up getting a couple extra and they don't provide a backpack anymore so we ended up buying our own backpacks and then uh like somebody um michelle um was like uh, i guess she went and found us a couple old binoculars i think she did a face she did the facebook you know who's got binoculars for us so <laughs> We kind of re we, we rebuilt our own little back you know state park backpack kits. So, but yeah, the cultural passes would be a great way to kind of continue that idea. Maybe there's a maybe we could associate that. Maybe we could have a little backpack for that too, since that model is kind of fun for people. Good. And yet, I think uh, staff's choice now. I don't really have any updates. I just wanted to thank you all for a, a good year. I guess even though we were all stuck here on on the computers. All year most of it at least but i appreciate all your time um over at least you know the last 12 months since i got here in january and uh hopefully you guys have good holidays and stay safe well thanks yeah you too anything from school board or uh, city council nothing from the school board we've been remote uh, since early November. <laughs> um, I don't know, we'll probably be discussing what January looks like um, next week. Sorry, I'm losing all track of my weeks <laughs> as far as when we meet again. Um, I imagine that'll be something that we discuss next uh, next week. But um, other than that, we're just gearing up for winter break, I guess, and everybody's looking forward to that. Uh, I don't have a great deal to offer either at this point in time. We've still been um, conducting meetings remote. Uh, we took a vote again last night to continue for the time being. We revisited about monthly, um, but but the time doesn't seem to be right now to go back to uh, in person. We, I feel like we've been pretty functional all in all. You know, people can still call in um, and add to public comment or come in through video. You know, I, as I'm sure you guys know, some topics attract more attention than others. And so we, we certainly get uh, a wider audience for certain meetings than others. But we haven't had anything that's too high profile. Um, you know, I think we'll have some more things in the new year. So we've just got one more study session this coming Monday, and then we break for the year. Um, so I, I would wish you guys all happy holidays as well. Um, I know everybody's ready for a break. You're trapped in your home and everybody gets to be trapped in their home a little bit longer, but hopefully that's without uh, a great deal of work to do. Um, so certainly happy holidays to everyone as well. Um, I, I do love this time in Inglewood. It's my, I'm more on the south side of Inglewood. A lot of folks who do really, um, you know, Griswold National Lampoon level lighting on their house. And so it, it's very festive in this neck of the woods, but, but we drive all around town and check everything out. So this is one of my favorite times of the year in Inglewood. And it is a little tougher that you don't have some of the more communal things you have when everybody can be out, but uh, I still love it. And, and so uh, I'm, I'm sidetracking here, but, but happy holidays to you guys. And, and I think it's, it's a good time of year, even with the year being as tough as it's been. Great. Yeah, if there was an Englewood map of houses to go visit, I'd go check it out because it's, I don't know. 
Yeah, uh, sometimes too. <laughs> you know, I'm not aware of one. I think it's kind of the word okay. of mouth, those folks that are just, um, you know, year in, year out, they've done it. Um, I And then, you know, I just look for bright blocks too. Sometimes I just drive jo slowly down the, uh, the larger corridors and, and, and look for the bright ones. Um, <laughs> that, that's not a bad idea at all, Guy, actually, because I think we've got some that are pretty noteworthy um, throughout the city. Yeah, that's good. All right, uh, board members. Well, you know, we'd be happy to put that up on social media. So. <laughs> yeah, the library could share something. I don't know, I guess probably need people's permission though. You can't just tell people to go visit somebody's house, but uh. when you're on the street, <laughs> you're not going in their house, right? So, um, uh, board member's choice, yeah. So I finally got my uh, time, my little free library up myself. So I'm competing with the library now, not really. <laughs> I got a little library up. I don't think anyone's visited yet, but um, I'm happy to have some books out there that can We'll see if it withstands the next rainstorm. Um, anyone else? My husband saw some um, on next door. People were advertising about great places to go see lights. So we did that last night. Drove around like by a, in between Arapaho and Hamden, all in that area. And there are some crazy ones out there. And it is a good COVID activity because you don't even really have to get out of your car. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, I think that the on the next door app, like on my laptop, I think it's up at the upper right. It says like, like a uh, holiday uh, lights. Yeah, they have a map on there. My, my whole neighborhood's blank except for me now. So, <laughs> isn't it Delaware and Bellevue where they have the crazy? Oh, that's Illati. And that between guy, Illati. Yeah. I don't know if he was there this year. We were, uh, we couldn't He's find that there. house. The one that's all white with the weird boxes of like dolls. Yeah, and weird stuff. things. Is that what the one you're talking yeah. about? Yeah, that's Illati between Grand and Bellevue. Then. And that's a, a longtime family tradition. His, his dad started that. And uh, I used to take my kids when they were little, and now I'm taking my grandkids to the son's place. We saw it for the first time, and I was shocked. Like it was way it's like something. I saw it from Bellevue. I was like, "It's over there." It was <laughs> crazy, and it was awesome. <laughs> yeah. So, at next door does have a holiday map. If you click click on the top right, it says holiday cheer map, and you can see all the different places. Oh, cool! Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, hey, just happy holidays to everybody. That hope uh, it's been good good That's serving with you this year. See you next year. Thank you all. Yeah. Happy holidays. <laughs> okay. Happy holidays. See you guys next year. <laughs> all right. Take care. Be safe. Thank you. Bye.